You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast, and I am very pleased to um, have uh, for an interview uh, Lauren Redness. Uh, Lauren, just first off, before me babbling a little bit, welcome on to uh, Something Rather Than Nothing. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I um, I, I, I want to say that um, uh, in introducing you, I, I, I've noticed something very particular. Um, uh, I had seen the book and I heard uh, of your name and in, in, uh, read a radioactive about the Curies and um, and I ran into Oak Flat at Powell's bookstore in Portland, which is a, a unionized uh, bookstore uh, and uh, a wonderful place. And so they had this book and, and of course, just honestly, it was it was gorgeous and so appealing. I was surprised to find it so readily. And on the back, I noticed uh, a, a review for Oak Oak Flat, and it was by uh, an individual who I've read his writing, David Truer, who I had recognized as a very, very sharp, critical mind. Uh, and so I was interested as a book buyer and what he had to say, knowing that. And he said, Oak Flat left me stunned. History, testimony, art, landscape. Lauren Redness weaves these elements together to evoke the rock and sand and sky of the Arizona desert and to bring to life the story of people for whom that land is sacred. Rarely is a book simultaneously so heartfelt and so brilliant. I read that and uh, you know, I was always ready to run out of the store with the book, but I properly purchased it. And, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh you've you you're you're a renowned author and recognized for your um uh, unique art and 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 style um what i wanted to ask you lauren uh starting off is when did you see yourself as an artist when did you maybe inhabit that or, or feel that um yeah, I mean, as a kid, I was always making things. So that was just a very natural part of the day. You know, um, my dad had a workshop in the basement, and I would take stuff from the workshop. And, you know, I would make shoes, or I would make dolls, or I would make, you know, houses, like, you know, mi miniatures. And, um, and my grandfather and his brother, my great uncle had a, a small grocery store in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is where um, I think it's said, Wista. Said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think it's <laughs> I think it's Wista. OK, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the interruption, but it was in Worcester, Massachusetts. Right. Yeah, exactly. So when, when you said you were going to run out of Powell's with Oak Flat, I picture, you know, Abby Hoffman, of course, famous for Steal This Book, um, <laughs> lived just a couple streets away from my grandparents in Worcester. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. But um, so I was very connected to, um, oh, well, well, anyway, in terms of in terms of art, I, I spent a lot of time at that grocery store in Worcester, Worcester, um, <laughs> um, making things. You know, I used to make... Um, Jewelry, quote unquote, jewelry for the customers out of rubber bands and garbage ties. I would make a lot of signage, um, you know, just like all of the material of the store was fodder for making stuff. And um, and so I remember, like, as I got older, people would ask me, are you going to be an artist when you grow up? You know, in that kind of way, adults talk to children. And um, and I always felt so bewildered by that question because it didn't seem like a thing I was doing. It just seemed like, you know, the most natural kind of way of going through the world that wasn't like its own thing that would have to have a label. So I remember never, you know, that just consciously kind of um, recoiling a bit at that idea yeah. that here's this future thing that will later have a label later label and later be official when I was like, wait, isn't this just like, what well, you know, what it is. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I think later on, you know, I guess like I had to declare a major in college. So I declared an art major, but you know, it was always just kind of 
natural and automatic. Yeah, I um I, I was really struck by the common phrase you had mentioned about that that adults will say because I hadn't heard it kind of the way until you had said it there about it being like the what do you what do you mean right and I think <laughs> I think um here's one of the things I believe as 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 an adult um about adults some mm. of that kind of power and that dynamic in pointing towards adulthood is a uh, bunch of BS <laughs> it's 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 um there's there's no greater world out there you know it, it's it's inhabited by kids and, and, and kids are kids but by mm -hmm. saying that it's like you have to enter the adult world and have defined yourself as an artist and I talked to I know this is 180 plus episodes so many artists where I know that they weren't called an artist so how do you hear the word or inhabit it or know how to yeah. connect with it and, and, and become it. And I think the shock of that question to you, I could imagine it, you know, precocious and like doing your thing. And you're like, what do you mean? I'm the only artist in the store right now. Like I'm <laughs> doing it. Like, you know, what do you mean when I'm older? So I was really struck by what you had to say there. It's funny, right? Cause it introduces like a kind of, like, as you say, an adult self-consciousness that children might not have in that I think is slightly anathema to art making, actually, you know, when you're in that kind of self-conscious part of your brain, I think is when you start to self-censor or make choices about what you think you should do rather than what is kind of like um, an organic or, um, you know, kind of um, what's it called? Um, I don't know. Uh, what's the opposite of self-conscious? Like, um, just you know, just like flourishing, um, like a flourishing, like, or, or, or like an outflowing of, of. Yeah. Just like, um, you know, something that's like, I, I don't know. There's like a specific word that's eluding me, but yeah, it's, um, um, right. Just some, whatever the opposite of self-conscious is. Well, it's, 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 it's fine, Lauren, you know, we're going to stumble on this episode of two, you know, book geeks, not allowing the episode to continue until the right word is spoken, but we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll continue. We'll continue with it. Um, no, it's, 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 it's a question I ask so much and uh, I've become fascinated by early childhood and um, maybe some conversations I've had along those lines of how we developed. I want to tell you a, a curious quick story uh, before my next question connected to this. So um, I started uh, identifying as an artist overtly myself five years ago. And um, that changes my composition, how I breathe and all those type of things. So in my head, I would have things that I can and can't do, right? Like yeah. us all, we all have that story. And I'll tell yeah. you something, something interesting. I've never been uh, at all the type of an artist or a painter or illustrator that can reflect what I see to, yeah. to what it is. It's more abstract or I, I can't connect those things exactly in my head. But I'll tell you one thing that happened one month ago, I was taking my first organized art class online for two months. Uh, for two months. And I had a drawing exercise, which was the upside down exercise. Oh, yeah. So the figure was upside down. And I'm looking at this and I'm starting to do that. And my ability to illustrate sketch and to understand the connection between dimension and shape, I was like, yeah, oh, so for my entire life, for me to feel some particular things in this process, I needed to look at things upside down <laughs> right. to help yeah. develop that. And it was just, just so amazing. And who knows, like when you think about with kids, you know, maybe that type of activity when you're young and rather than me saying, I can't sketch, I can't think in that right. way. I can, but maybe my mind's tilted one way or the other. It's really strange. Yeah. Well, I think an exercise like that is, a way of um, trying to shed our to shed convention and to shed all of the habits and kind of cultural, um, you know, moss that's grown onto the, our way of seeing the world. And um, no shade on moss, no pun intended. I mean, love love moss, but um, but I think like it's you know when you see something upside down, you, you can see it in a way for the first time because you don't see 
um, you don't distort it in your mind based on um, a kind of hierarchy of what's important. I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to, I want to ask you one of the, one of the big questions and um, I'm going to do a quick intro to it. Um, uh, Listeners wouldn't be able to hear this, would be able to hear this, not see this, but this, uh, I got Oak Flat by Lauren Redness, the book. And I would say I could get into complicated arguments about art, but what I would tell you is that the experience of reading this book and almost feeling the illustrations of the people and wanting to place my hands on the book to feel the contours of the land as reflected in your drawings. That's art. But Lauren Redness, author of the book that I just described, what is art? <laughs> um, right. Wow. Okay. Um, that's a big question. Um, I don't want to be glib um, or, or too narrow either. Um, I think that art is surprisingly slippery to try to define. I think it's easy to kind of slide into the waters of um, taste and subjectivity. So I want, that's not where I would position my relationship to art at least, or how I would understand or define it. I, when I think about that question, I find myself returning to definitions that are more um, verb than noun, if that makes sense, more like action and process rather than thing. Um, I guess I think of art as a struggle to express the ineffable. I think of it as a deliberate act of creation that helps us see things more clearly or help us unsee something that we thought we saw clearly, complicate what we thought we saw clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've i had conversations recently with guests, and I noticed the, the verb thing. I had somebody answer the question, oh. and they had answered it mostly in action, like mm-hmm. listing things. And I hadn't yeah. heard that in a while, but it was like, uh, it was all verbs. And I was like, oh, and so it's re- it's interesting that you just said it in that way there, because I've mm-hmm. been thinking about it, um, how that was such a different answer. It was all in all in uh all in action. Um, okay. One, I have a, a, a particular question just for you, as far as um, the the range of uh, the the work uh, that you've that you've done um, in with uh, Oak Flat and um, and the time the time machine and uh, thunder and lightning and uh, radioactive. Um, I would surmise that you know in order to go into what you create, you, you go in with a, I don't know, heart and connection and all, all in. How do you choose? The assumption for me is that you're going to be deeply interested in a lot of things that you could do in, in yeah. create. And there's a disparate quality to what you have chosen I'm particularly interested in how do you choose to go in 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 this way in art um, in your projects? Yeah. So, I mean, I, just in case your listeners don't um, don't know exactly what we're talking about. So, I write or the books that you've mentioned, which has been the focus of much of my work in the past many years, is nonfiction books that are also visual books. So, what I'm trying to do is. Um, create a complete work of art. So I report and write the text. I create artwork that's on not every page, but many, most of the pages. So it feels like a kind of, um, you know, fully visual, fully color object, but I also design the cover and the end pages and usually the font. Um, So it's like um, a kind of whole gestalt. (laughs) <laughs> that trying to make like sort of an immersive experience of reading and looking. Um, so how do I choose a subject? 
um, it's really, really different each time. I think that if there's a, a continuity or a thread, um, it's the not knowing that brings me in. It's like, um, what are, is this, is this kind of um, subject gnarled and complicated and nuanced enough that I will um, make discoveries in exploring it, in, in digging further. And I want something that doesn't have like clear cut answers or simple dichotomies. Um, I wanna have some, I wanna explore complicated questions and, um, you know, and just, and, and make connections between, um, you know, it, I mean, it's different in, in every case, but, um, you know, for instance, you mentioned radioactive. So in that case, I'm making non-chronological connections between the lives and love affairs of Marie and Pierre Curie, the great scientists, and um, the more recent repercussions of their scientific research. So, um, and then in Oak Flat, you know, there's a whole different set of, um, of questions that are, you know, more, a more contemporary set of, well, in, in its own way, more contemporary to the story that's still unfolding about a copper mine that's being developed on Apache sacred land in Southeastern Arizona. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's always like a different set of, of questions and I don't, I don't have like a formula for what makes a project something that I'm going to, you know, spend four or five years on, but it's really about like, um, is it messy enough to get into? Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, on a particular point, <clears throat> excuse me, on a particular point, uh, you had mentioned, uh, I, uh, the, the grander story that you tell, such as in, in, in radioactive, um, I think for me, that, uh, is, uh, the part of the success in doing it. Cause you have to pull off the expansive thought from the events and maybe the love story and the historical events, but for you to advance through those decades and, and that's, that's the task. And that's why it's successful because, it's getting and moving through those uh, extrapolate. That ain't the right word. The development, the development yeah. of 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 the story. Um, so to bring everybody along with that development, that's that that that's just um, that's just incredible. What is what is the um, what do you, what do you think the role? of of art is or if you want to talk about it personally when when you're putting out your art what do you think it should be doing oh wow okay so yeah i definitely see those as two different questions because i don't even know i mean oftentimes i will if someone says what do you do sometimes i will say i'm an artist because it's easy to say that um and not it's the most kind of general and as we as we've been talking about ill-defined category so I like that about it it also sounds kind of pretentious in a way <laughs> or well, people might stop talking to you unless yeah. I'm over at the gallery and yeah, you bring yeah. it up and then, then you're like oh this usually works but not with this guy <laughs> right right no totally it's like sometimes people just think oh that means you're unemployed you know um, <laughs> but, um, grifter um, yeah exactly <laughs> So um, I don't, and and I mean I don't approach I approach my work in a pretty kind of like brass tacks way you know like what I'm drawn to like I, I mean I do nonfiction work and I draw oftentimes or usually from life so um, I'm drawing from reality um, and um, in terms of like. So, so I don't know, in a way, it's a more uncomfortable question for me about my own work, but what do I think about what, what do I value in art? What do I think its role is in the, in a bigger picture? Um, I mean, to co connect us with the sublime, to um, give meaning to our lives beyond the quotidian or, you know, the kind of everyday making a living, getting by, it's it's something bigger it's something grander it's something you know that is almost out of body and i think that is you know it's 
I think for a long time I questioned like be, you know you know following this path because I wondered is it does it have enough kind of relevance in the world today are there more kind of direct practical things I could be doing to you know I don't know address the climate crisis like what could it, you know yeah. what 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 am I going to do with my life and and um and I think like like I don't know. I've found myself coming back to art. And I mean, I think I do it. I try to address practical things in my work, if not in a practical way, <laughs> but, um, you know, but, um, but I think it's so beautiful and I think it's, it is universal and we see it, you know, you can look back tens of thousands of years and you see people making beautiful things. Well, yeah. And, and well, I mean, I, it, it it's, Asking the big question, you know, set you up the answer to the big question, but going back to like Oak Flat for me, as far as the practical matter of this, I'm I'm an organizer by trade. This is this is a story. This is this is beautiful images. This is connection between people organizing, yeah. working together as as a community. So I, I, you know, it's tough. Like, how do you talk about it? But I would talk about it in all those all those ways as an accessible piece in that way. I would have this on a table at my union hall or wherever just to celebrate the images and in, uh, indigenous folks. But also, yo, people can band together and you're going to lose sometimes and you're going to win sometimes. So but there's different ways of approaching um, this. Like I said, I was pawing over the. <laughs> the painting so i guess there's different ways you know it's um uh very uh inviting and um if you don't invite people in with the art you're not you're not connecting and uh, i don't know i'm i'm just yeah. kind of talking out loud a bit but no i mean i'm really happy to hear you say all of those things and even that you would put it up you know, put the book on the table in your union office or something. I mean, that's, there's sort of no better um, review that I could get than what you've just said. I mean, I remember um, for a long time, I thought, oh, I'll, I was, I had this idea that I'd be a painter and I was like alone by myself painting. And then I would go to galleries and I felt like this was so disconnected from anything that I really cared about. And I remember I started doing drawings for the New York times and, um, and I, I saw one of my drawings for the New York Times book review one time on the steps leading down to the subway in New York, getting stepped on and smushed and just, you know, decimated. Ah! And I, was like, oh! I was like, I made it. You know, that to me was just so much more meaningful that here is this thing that you could put out in the world that anyone could get just about. It was so accessible um, that that meant a lot more to me than, you know, having a painting in a gallery. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, that's that. You know that's 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 the unique way, but I think that's right there, and I I just loved that that entry point, and there's so many ways to do it, but um, and I think the power of the story, your ability to tell the story where it feels like you're telling the story and not kind of overt angles and things like that, you're telling the heart of the story, and there's some complications and inflections, and but like the story um the story itself is there so uh yeah oak oak flat thanks powells for having that and um uh just 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 great stuff yeah and talking about the um uh the role of the role of art um i wanted to uh i wanted to mention one other piece about the book um which probably just finishes out the point of how your the book as a whole, uh, you really have the book of as a as a whole, including the book cover design, and when you made the comment about it being like encapsulated and and all there, I got a greater sense of that whole thing. So we're gonna have um, words, uh, images, jacket, painting, uh, a display, and. Is that something you always try to do with, let's say it's a book, with it's a book, do you, you, you try to have it all there and to have all the pieces there that you've created? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. I mean, I'm a real control freak, you know, and I love books and I love like, I mean, I think 
you know, it always, it just, I would, sometimes I'd see a book that would have certain beautiful aspects, but then s- other things that didn't fit or like, you know, you can, I mean, I, I think like a few things. Um, I mean, yeah, because the text is so important and the artwork is so important. It just made sense that the, that the, the letters on the page would have to have that significance too. And I mean, if you think about the history of writing, right, this comes from hieroglyphics and everything was a pictogram at one point. Right. All of every single letter that we are now familiar with is, you know, connected to this to this history of of drawing and um, all of those marks that we make when we make when we write when we write words, we're we're drawing handwriting is drawing and um, typography is, you know, and and digitized fonts or, um, you know, lead lead. Um, typesetting, all of these connect to that history too. So that just made sense to me that I'm making this artwork, I'm telling this story, I'm interviewing these people, I'm conveying their words. Those words should exist on the page in a in a in a considered way, in a way that is is taken into account with as much care as any other aspect of this. Otherwise, you know, it's like forgetting an ingredient in your dish or you know what I mean? Or like yeah. not something all the way through so it just made sense to me that 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 the artwork is the book itself and so every part of that needs to be considered and you know like if you frame a painting a framer takes real care in thinking about the mat the frame the you know what what type of wood what style it's all of that is is so obvious to us right or if a filmmaker does a score for their film again, like it's completely natural to think that that score should, you know, really fit and really amplify the themes and the ideas of the film. So so that's what I think I'm doing when, you know, just kind of um, having each piece be part of the whole. Yeah. That, 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 that really, that really answers the question. (laughs) So, so uh, next question, I want to tell you, uh, I, I, before my next question, I have things like I'm going to say even before, but um, I have this. Um, so I prep, I prep, you know, for for my guests, and uh, I've usually read the books or listen to podcasts, and I take notes, and I take more direct notes of some of the questions asking you know, what is what is art and all those, and we get a couple more of those, and then I had these looser notes, which were I'd say my art notes on this. Uh-huh. And I'm going to tell you what they say, oh, and, really? and I don't think it will help us in the conversation, but just for the sake of it. So I have Lauren Redness and says, art slash philosophy, science slash art, science <laughs> slash philosophy. Okay, so that didn't, those weren't the guideposts, but I was definitely thinking of um, the combination of those and your movement between those of the, the, uh, the science, art, philosophy for me. And the other one is uh, I have a note um, and I know you've been really into science. And I said, I think she likes worms. And <laughs> and I'm just I'm just being really open here. on that too. I, I'm in I'm in Oregon. I have a worm hut in the back that I like use for like we use the compost and fertilize and everything. So even though I'm a city kid from Rhode Island, yeah, uh, I got my Oregon stripes because I got an Oregon uh, worm hut. So I don't. I had worms written down there too. So I don't know. Uh, uh, but it went all the way from art, philosophy, science, and then the word worms. So that's what these notes say. So well, that makes perfect sense to me. So great. <laughs> Well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the whole <laughs> this is the whole uh, interview. I wanted to let's do another big let's do another big one. Um, uh, the philosophy one, which is the why is there something rather than nothing? And I would just say quickly, the words that I mentioned before, I see how they're connected to that because it's for me the answer is always like art, philosophy, science. Why, why is there something rather than nothing? And what your thoughts were. Hmm. Well, um, I'm not sure I know what nothing is. I was talking to my son the other day about the cosmos and the universe, and he said, well, beyond the universe, there is nothing. 
And of course, immediately we both start to picture nothing, right? Which makes it something. Um, earlier, um, I heard the Dalai Lama say something to the effect of um, nothing exists at it, at nothing exists as it appears. I think is what he said. Um, which is, you know, almost like a riddle in a certain sense. Yeah. And then if you think nothing as something, it's like, here's the thing, nothing, which exists as it, as it appears, which is like, it's like a kind of inherent paradox. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> hey, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's uh, answer. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the quick, I haven't mentioned this in probably a little while since one guest gave the correct answer to it, or at least an answer that I accept. <laughs> that I accept is correct to it. And I'm a yeah. huge hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy fan. Um, Douglas Adams, great science fiction writer in, in the series. You can answer the question. I just asked by saying 42 and you will have won the game show, just the number 42 <laughs> can win the game show. So if any, yes, you know, in the future really like the show, but do not want to deal with, uh, a silly or absurd question. You can say 42 afterwards. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> <laughs> um I wanted to uh I wanted to ask you about uh a, a, a piece that you had mentioned. Um with the way that you put your books together, you're incorporating these forms uh, of art. And I heard you talk about um, you know, consideration of, of, of painting. If you take a the discrete, let's say paintings, if, if, if you took the discrete paintings that are, that are here and they were displayed differently, um, would that work for you? Like I'll, I heard you talking about the context, right? Is, I guess what I'm asking is, could you see yourself identifying as a painter with with those there um pulling that piece out yeah um i pref well i think yeah but so i mean sometimes my work is displayed you know as with the kind of pages pulled apart and it's like exhibit as if it, as if it's fine art right now i think um they're in boulder on one of the underpasses they have like a blown up, a series of pages from Oak Flat that are blown up as a kind of wall mural on the underpass, which I think is super cool. And I love that because it's I'll like, it's I'll check, I'll check the GPS, how far that is right now. Yes. I, okay. Boulder. <laughs> um, but, um, but it's, it's not, I think how the work is best experienced because I really think of the book as one piece of art. It's the book is one thing, you know? So it's like to take out any page or sometimes I get, you know, I'm asked like to do a reading and I find that really awkward because everything is really interdependent. So if I pull out a piece, I find it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense out of context or it's certainly deprived of most of its meaning and most of it's like resonance. So, um, you know, I try, even if I'm including like a set of facts, I try to have those facts like be embedded in a, a series of contexts that, that makes them more robust and have like, just mean that much more. And um, so I find it a kind of flattening and like, you know, sort of a minimizing effect. It's like less than the sum of its parts or whatever, or the parts are reduced by not being yeah. experienced together. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, when you were talking about even like frame and things like that, I, I, I'd say that I myself, because of hyper focus, maybe on one element, I, I think now uh, maybe leaving some of those details behind, I've been chided or frames or the the framing or frames of, of paintings that I do so uh, which I appreciate um but and, and whereas I've get I've received a, a photograph uh from uh an artist um Anya Khan for example who've been on my show and yeah. the frame the metal frame and there's like rivets in every 
absolutely gorgeous. And I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. this is the great art, great frame kind of melding. So I, I really yeah. feel that with the framing or how it's presented. Yeah. All right. So what's next? Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask about um, the, uh, a little bit more about the science piece. I know you've had a deep interest uh, in that. Um, and of course, uh, reflective in the incredible story within uh, radioactive um there was one piece in there that uh was so beautiful to me in radioactive and i hadn't considered because i don't because i hadn't considered i hadn't considered as they're extracting uh radium and, and doing all those scientific processes and it, it it's it's glowing it has these properties that are that are mystical and people don't know it's really something yeah, not to apply to yourself but there was this description of um the curies working in their lab and by the colors that were now appearing and i imagine them appearing in this scientific way for the first time and that visual just blew my mind because i didn't think of this new you know, the radioactive material and these mystical light properties and how people are looking at it. Is this the God juice or like, what is this? I thought that was so, and of course I would say magical. That was the first word that would come out of it, but it was the science in uh, the magic uh, there. Did, did I really capture like what, that feel i mean i got that visual and it was like a new magic new sorcerers or new uh, science it was so fantastical but 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 real was, was that what was really kind of there yeah so i think what you're describing is when the curious recognized that, that um certain rocks emitted a ra radio radio radiation and that's a word that Marie Curie um, coined, radioactivity. And um, so they wanted to to distill the, um, you know, to get at exactly what material in that rock, which was like, you know, a composite. It was like what they had tested to that that um, gave that effect was what they call um, pitch blend, which was a um, a waste product of mimes you know, ceramics mines in, in Southern Bohemia. And um, so they, um, you know, this waste product was not considered to have any value. So they were able to get many, many tons of it delivered to their lab in Paris, which was, you know, a kind of rundown shed that had been used previously for human dissection, which as it turned out um, may have saved their lives because it had inadvertent ventilation because there were so many, so it was so drafty. Um, so in any case, it took them years but this kind of backbreaking labor, they were able to distill down um, about a tenth of a gram of radium chloride from these mountains of of, of black rock. And a tenth glowed, of a gram. A tenth of a gram. Yeah. And um, it glowed in the dark. So, I mean, you can imagine, right? You're doing backbreaking labor night and day for four years with this just like what feels like a pile of junk. And then all of a sudden you get this tiny specimen that's glowing in the dark whoa and you can imagine right that's yeah goosebumps and um so so needless to say they were like completely enamored of this and so marie started sleeping with a little vial of the radium chloride by her bedside and when they would go to the lab at night she described that experience as being like surrounded by faint fairy lights and so when the public caught wind of this and you know it was a sensation. And like you say, it started, um, the Curies were um, were um, adamant that they didn't want to patent radium. And they didn't want it to have, you know, they didn't want to profit commercially from their discoveries, but other people were totally fine with that. And so, um, you know, there's, and I'm sure a lot of the products didn't even have any radium in it because at the, that time it was extremely expensive and hard to get, but, um, but there were radium chocolates, radium, I mean, you name it, any kind of beauty product. There was radium laced water. So people were really poisoning themselves left and right. And this is before the, you know, big class action 
lawsuit by the radium girls who painted the watch dials in New Jersey. Oh, who yeah. would, you know, they would lick their brushes and they would get that, they would ingest that radium paint. And some of them would they would look in the mirror and they'd be glowing from the waist up. Whoa. So um yeah. Yeah. So you know, yeah, it was like um it was a kind of magical or seemingly magical, but the magic was in the misunderstanding, right? The magic, I mean, I guess that's part of what magic is. It's something inexplicable, right? And yeah. the the problem was what was yet to be explained was that this was deeply toxic. Yeah. Uh, wow. Thank you for 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 talking more about that. That was just so striking, and I hadn't I hadn't ever considered the whole backdrop of the newness that's produced and what the newness could possibly could possibly look like um just just completely fascinating and it's like you know you mentioned the the work towards that you know within science or doing books <laughs> that at the end oh yeah. there it is or you know yeah. right there and 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 it's glowing um just uh i love the consideration of science and magic and the just the complete unknown i saw the scene uh, that that i was reading in there in a way that was uh in it like a 1980s um like horror movie aesthetic as well mm -hmm. so it was like kind of in the basement in the only like formal life so my brain translated it into a film and so i could <laughs> understand it but um mm -hmm. Uh, um, so one of the, one of the things I want to ask, and you don't have to, um, you know, reveal an, anything, but, um, the, I know you teach and that's an active part, um, of, you know, your, your encounter with, with art. Um, what is that experience like, uh, for you as far as, you know, your, your, your role and in being able to connect in that way and bringing art uh forward um how's that process for you because i know teaching i've taught before at the university and it's a different animal it's not easy to explain to other people but how's that work out for you as a as a creator well i think um what i try to do with my students in in recent years that the focus of my teaching has been um, a senior thesis class. So I'm working with students on their own project, self-generated work. And um, so I see my role really as helping them figure out what they're trying to do and um, helping them identify their strengths and build on those, helping them figure out what questions they're really asking in their work, helping them get to like, um, something kind of substantive at the heart of the work rather than say an aesthetic choice or a stylistic kind of you know quirk or something like that so it's not so much about like um oh you could make that red you know what I mean it's like it's like why did you make this blue you know it's like what are you trying to do why are you you know like if say if someone's making um so the beauty of the the senior thesis class is like I'll have people making say a graphic novel, a children's book, um, an installation, um, a video about, um, you know, growing up in a place where there are a lot of earthquakes. Um, um, what else? I mean, people make animations, people like, so it's just like absolutely varied. So that keeps me on my toes. I have to go from student to student and be ready with like, you know, technical advice, but also conceptual guidance. Um, and, um, yeah, so I think like I see my role not as kind of trying to get students to do anything specific, but as bringing out something that is in them and helping them develop the skills that they can then use to evolve as an artist over a career. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. I grew up, uh, you know, city kid in Rhode Island, but right next to um, Rhode Island School of Design. In Providence, Rhode Island, which was a um, a mystical place for me. <laughs> it was, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, kid growing up, um, you know, it's not like art museums and stuff. And I was, you know, curious, but I was they, they took us on a field trip there once. 
Yeah. And uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island is not in. It was kind of like down industrial at the time, uh, 70s yeah. and say 80s. But they took us over to Rhode Island School of Design and they, you know, they let us loose in the museum. <laughs> and um, I can't describe the experience to you. I was young. I was like 10. But the biggest yeah. part of my experience, which just froze in my head, was that there was this room with an 11th century Zen uh, wooden Buddha. So I'm yeah. a little, I'm, I'm little Kenny. And then this thing's like 17 feet tall. I can fix it. Yeah. And, uh, I, my, my, my kid mind, I'm staring at it because you could see kind of like chips out of it. And, you know, I had to be out in a, in weathered conditions, but all together and the chips and I'm just looking at it. And I'm like, how's this thing? Like, when's that year? And I'm staring at it. Yeah. I was so moved by the image of 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 the Buddha, of the wood Buddha, um, it froze in my head. And I even had a poster of it in my office when I worked for a uh, teacher's union in Madison, had that up for years. And um, I went back just a few years ago because I'm like, I haven't been here in years. Now I'm like Mr. Art guy. Maybe I can understand a lot of this more. And I go to see it and just what the experience was. Now, the experience was still incredibly moving but of course it was it wasn't the it wasn't like the size of king kong like like it was in my head and the amazing part of it was that the intent of that piece the of of the, the of the work of the statue is to invoke you know maybe the calm of the buddha and things like that and I tell you, that room for me, even when I was a little kid, was different than any other place I had been. I don't know. I'm not trying to like build it up into something, but it was so different that I'm like, what's going on here? Or at least in this room is like, is what is this? And mm -hmm. that that piece for me has always been uh, always been in, been incredible. So it's like. City kid, and then the art experience of having a world renowned school, Rhode Island School of Design, that you take a, a trip over to. And what I do, you know, what I think about now to this to this very day. And so that's like the power for me, you know, of it. And I think, you know, what if you're not like, what if you're in Nebraska and there isn't a, a RISD or maybe. You know, they cut arts programs all over the place. Schools are a little bit like a factory or a lot like a factory, depending on, what, you know, there's a lot of stuff going yeah. on, you know. So um, those moments, I think, are in, in, incredible. And I, I think for you, uh, just like in the works that that you have and encounter them and how they impact people and affect people. I always try to talk to the artists themselves and saying this, this is, this is, this is a big deal. This is, this is what's happening. And um, so I just really appreciate uh, what you do. I want to ask generally and see what we tap into. What, where do, where do people find you? How do they find you, um, your works or, or maybe what's coming up? You could say anything you want about what's coming up, but I know it has to be uh... a, <laughs> <laughs> said in a certain way yeah so i mean the easiest way to connect me with me is just to read my books um they're really easy to get to, um either ordering online um from an independent bookstore or any of the you know evil corporations um and uh, <laughs> um and um i'm gonna have a website that has all of those and um, I'm also on Instagram. I don't really post very much, but I'm there lurking. And um, yeah, those are the kind of easiest ways. I pop up in other, other places with shows and stuff from time to time, but those are the most straightforward way. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that always falls flat, Lauren. <laughs> I'm feeling adventurous. <laughs> And I have the sets it could fall flatter for you. And what I'm saying, it's a it's a compliment what I'm saying within this. But um I'd be interested in uh what what you uh see, watch, or reading that you're like, shit, this is this is this is this is art. This is going on. This is changing the neurons in my brain. 
Anything doing that? Oh, well, I just saw, um, this is a really, um, you know, mainstream recommendation, but I just saw the, of, that incredibly beautiful film, All That Breathes, which was nominated for a, a Oscar. I it yet. Tell us about it. It's so beautiful. It's, um, the director is 24 years old, um, a Indian director, and the, it's a documentary, but it feels like a feature. I screened it for my, um, some of my students and some of the other faculty were there and I had two faculty who thought it was a feature film when they're these guys know film like yeah. they know on inside and out but it's so the the director spent so much time with his subjects who are um two brothers and uh, a friend of theirs who run a bird hospital in New Delhi and um it's the guys are like philosophers the pacing of the film is so elegant and um transporting it's visually it's stunning it's just so moving the politics of it are very subtle um or at least i think that's a fair assessment they're subtle but they're no less um effective and you know strong because of yeah. that and um yeah so that's just really really sublime and um I'm reading a few books. Um, I read a lot for work, so those aren't always like the recommendations that, uh, you know, because I might be reading something that's not like what I would consider a great book, but it's a useful book for what I'm researching. Um, and I'm reading an oral history about, um, a, like, a, I don't, I, I'm not going to be able to say it because it has a click in it, Kung, oh. like, Kung, um, woman called Nisa. Um, which my husband and I found at a used bookstore recently and reading a Walter Mosley novel. And um, yeah, sort of some- yeah, Well, uh, to, to, to pull it in a different direction, I've seen cocaine beer twice in the movies. Um, I oh, do have, I have, no, I mean, you look behind me, Lauren, there's, there's highbrow stuff. I got yeah. my creds and I've read them, but uh, yeah, I did cocaine yeah. beer yeah. twice, which, um, let me tell you one thing. The first time that I saw it, I uh, needed that absurd 1980s jumpsuit uh, aesthetic and the relief of the crazy story. I laughed for an hour and a half. I felt better and laid down afterwards. So. <laughs> well, you know, I, I still don't even know what cocaine bear is. Um, so I hear uh, I'll tell you. All right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. You know, I mean, you just gave a, a, a delicate, uh, considered, uh, recommend art recommendations and I'll try my best as well. So there's, there's, <laughs> there's this guy. So in the, with regards to the mood, the store, the real story is dude falls out of a plane with millions and millions and millions of dollars of coke and it falls out of plane plane crashes there's cocaine all over the place in the woods i think it was some uh down in georgia that's what happened and the dude died because he had too much weight on him and uh so they tell this the the scene with it where the guy falls out at the beginning well that's the end of the real story <laughs> everything that happens after is the cocaine develop uh, the bear develops a, a cocaine uh, predilection and uh, goes on a rampage, and that's the the whole rest of the story. It is like oh in this weird, and it hits it hits here, and it's tough to pull this off. Like gruesome comedy that's just gruesome comedy, and it can be uh, way too much. But I went. I went twice, so I don't know what that reports about me. <laughs> I have read the the new Cormac McCarthy uh, novels that I had been waiting for forever uh, and ever, um, and um, really, really enjoyed those. And another thing, Lauren, uh, final like question I wanted to ask you, and this is a curiosity. Uh, I've been reading a lot of a lot of zines and getting a lot of zines in Portland and okay. such. Um, I wonder your thoughts about those, or if you interact with those at all. Yeah. Oh, I love I love zines. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I love I um, they they have a couple like comic 
in zine fairs in New York where I live. And um, I found this, I found this object one time, like a little book and um, it is all pattern. There's no title. There's no author identified. There's absolutely no text or letters anywhere on this object. You can't, there's, and I've never been like so delighted by a book. It was like so um, separate from any kind of capitalist possibility. You know, there's no way to find like where this thing was made or who made it or how to, you know, market it or whatever. And that is just so fantastic. But, um, you know, my students make lots of zines and yeah, I think they're just like a great, great form. Yeah, so I really good. I, I really love them. The podcast is putting out its second zine. Um, mm. I could send you a copy of the, oh, of the nice. first one, but the second one uh, is going to be all indigenous uh, uh-huh. issue and just figuring out some uh, uh, printing on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's been um, a vibrant and it's very big out here as well and connected to some things I'm really interested in, such as um kind of mutual aid work amongst people so they can fill in a nice niche as far as organizing um but just beautiful poetry and such so love the creativity uh love the creativity there um uh lauren um i know you have a life and i think a new york city life which is uh from my (laughs) recall a different pace shall i say reporting here from the uh, sleepy idols of Oregon uh, most of the time. So I know, I know um, uh, I I just wanted to say, I I mean, I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, uh, Encountering your work uh, was exciting for me. And the way I, the way I approach this and do the show is I don't try to buffer that enthusiasm. So uh, appreciation for, for uh, all those, uh, tons of rocks you process <laughs> through over years <laughs> to get the bright magic um i really appreciate you lauren thank you so much it's been really really great to talk with you yeah uh well i hope we get to talk again soon and take care okay you too This is Something Rather Than Nothing, 